Hey guys, this is our first video. We are two brothers who will take turn presenting each one another building, city element or theoretical framework in architecture that fascinates us. And we will look at the environment that shaped them and the influences they have until this day. Today is my turn and I'd like to talk about Karl Friedrich Schinkel's Bar Academy and why it is considered to be one of the first modern buildings nearly a century before the modern movement started. It was built between 1832 and 36 and witnessed Prussia becoming the most powerful German kingdom, the unification of those kingdoms into the German Empire, the First World War, Weimar Germany, the Second World War and East Germany. It was destroyed in the 1960s to make way for the GDR's foreign ministry. In 2016, the German parliament decided that it should be rebuilt with as much Schinkel as possible. But when we walk through Berlin nowadays, we only see the mock-up of one room and a building corner. The question about reconstruction has divided the German public and especially German architects so strongly that seven years later nothing has been approved. To understand why the Bar Academy was such a pivotal building and why there is so much debate about its reconstruction, we will take a look at different aspects that it led up to its construction and the impact it had on Prussian and then German building culture. First we will look at the predominant movement in the artistic world and in Germany at the time. The most important style was Romanticism. When we look at a romantic painting, we can often see a glorification of nature or what art historians call the sublime. We can also see that the inner life of the people inhabiting the painting is brought to the forefront. Probably the most prominent painter of the Romantic era is Caspar David Friedrich. And when looking at one of his paintings, it is easy to see both of those aspects or to lose oneself in it completely. The second strand that we will look at is German idealism and more specifically the ideas of Johann Gottlieb Fichte as laid out in his book The Developmental View of Self-Consciousness. Fichte argued that the self is not a fixed identity but that it is malleable and that knowledge can't be gained passively but that one has to actively participate in the world and confront different ideas in order to gain knowledge. This is closely linked to the romantic side that we talked about earlier, as Fichte was influenced by romantic ideas and romantic artists were influenced by writers such as Fichte. The third avenue that we will look at is the historic side. When we talk about history of the late 18th and early 19th century in Europe, there's probably nothing more important than the French Revolution and the then ensuing Napoleonic Wars. The French Revolution brought new ideas to the forefront such as Liberté, Égalité, Fraternité and the Declaration of Rights of Men and of the Citizen brought a new way of thinking about society and people into the world. But when we look at Prussia we can see how threatening the French Revolution was to the kings of the period. Prussia was ruled by an absolute monarch who then led a concerted effort against the French Republic and subsequently Napoleon to stamp out revolutionary tendencies. These armed conflicts spanned from 1791 until 1816 and were a huge drain on the treasury and left little money for anything else. Lastly, we look at Berlin at the time that Schinkel was building in and where the Bau Academy was situated. When we look at the number of inhabitants in Berlin, we can see that in the 18th and 19th century there was a huge population boom, with a large number of the inhabitants being soldiers. When Schinkel was born in 1781, about 22% of the population were soldiers, and when the Bauer Academy was built in 1831, soldiers made up around 7.5% of the city population. Berlin was not a cultural center in Europe in comparison to the Italian or French city at the time, but there was a push in the 18th century to change that. In the neoclassical Greco-Roman debate about whether Greek or Roman antiquity had superiority, Berlin can be seen as leaning to the Greek side. There was the idea of Athen an der Spree, and a direct influence can be seen, for example, when we look at the main landmark, the Brandenburg Gate. 
we see that it takes close inspiration from the entrance building of the Athens Acropolis. Finally, we come to Schinkel. He was born in 1781 and died in 1841. He studied under the important Prussian architect Friedrich Schädli. After finishing his study, he went on to the traditional grand tour of Europe, where he was introduced to antique Roman ruins. And we know that he had Fichte's book, The Developmental View of Self-Consciousness, with him and studied it quite closely. In 1826, he traveled to Great Britain to examine the new industrial architecture that was being built there. And he expressed that he was saddened to see that the buildings were reduced to a complete functionality and nothing more. Because of his experience, he developed the idea of Zweckmäßigkeit, which translates into purposefulness. And he wrote down a number of rules on how good architecture should be made. Three ideas to highlight for our discussion are first the idea that architecture is about joining materials which has a long tradition with a lot of other thinkers before him and after him talking about it. Secondly, architecture should have a higher purpose and should talk about the higher aspects of the human being and the building. So, for example, when designing a museum, the design should talk about the holiness of art and also teach the viewer about art and making the art accessible to them. Finally, Schinkel highlights the importance of ornamentation. An underlying principle is that the best of everything should be used. The best possible preparation, the best material and the best worksmanship. Schinkel's work stood on concepts from the classical era and managed to combine them with novel romantic and idealistic ideas to combine something new. Before we look at any building by itself, we first have to situate ourselves in the urban fabric or in the nature that it's situated. Here on the urban plan we can see to the right is the museum island with the Berlin Dome and the edge of the royal garden with the royal palace. And we can see the river Spree cutting through the plan. In the middle we can see the Bau Academy with its adjacent plazas. The first is the rectangular plaza running along the river and the second one is opening up to the Werdische Markt and the Werdische Church which was also built by Schinkel and which used to be a marketplace in that part of Berlin. The Triangle Plaza has a row of trees going around it and this can be read as an effort to incorporate nature leading back to the romantic understanding of building as an extension of it. A second observation to point out is that the building is freestanding and separated from the rest of the urban fabric. The river creates an additional space and a mirrored ephemeral volume. When we look at the perspective we recognize a few things like the plaza with the trees and in the background we can see the church tower which are present in every painting and drawing of the Bau Academy. What we find quite quickly is that the building has a strong vertical and horizontal rhythm. When we look at the building in this depiction, references to Renaissance Palazzo architecture with the freestanding symmetrical volume and a strong rhythmic facade come easily to mind. This is also visible in the building's organization with shops on the lower floor and increasing of privacy the further up one goes in the building. When we come closer, we can see on the right side the ground floor and on the left side the first floor. What we notice is the mixed-use aspect of the building, with shops on the ground floor presenting themselves to the street and Werdische Markt. To get an idea what kind of shops there were, there was the royal jewelry in there, the royal china manufacturer, so really high-end establishments. The rent from the shops helped cover some of the building costs. As an architecture student, back in the time we entered the building from the triangular square. From there, the central stair along the patio leads up to the upper floor, where we can find the rooms of the Bau Academy School. On the second floor was the office of the Oberbaudeputation, the highest building authority in Prussia, which Schinkel had it for a long time. Also, the old Schinkel with his family had a 600 square meter private apartment there. A few interesting things to note here is that the building is organized in a 5.5 meter grid, with 64 regular tiles. And we have those three long walls here, but also find columns on the intersection points of the units. 
when we look at the section, we can see point foundations going down into the ground and strips underneath the wall. The question is, why would you do that? Especially coming out of the classical era where walls were the main load-bearing elements in a building. The answer is that Berlin has really bad soil to build on. It's basically a marshland. So it was decided to drill down point foundations and this is one of the aspects that makes it such an innovative building because we have here basically a skeletal construction. What we can see as well is that Schinkel uses vaults to span the distance, more specifically Prussian cap vaults. These are then rested on the columns and arches and when we look at the ground floor we can see that the longitudinal axis is directed towards the window in order to let as much sunlight in as possible. Another aspect I'd like to talk about is the facade. We talked about ornamentation and Schinkel's idea of Zweckmäßigkeit. He uses the facade to integrate aspects to cater to the higher purpose of a building, one of his integral design ambitions. In resemblance to Greek friezes, prefabricated terracotta plates on the facade depict mythical moments in architecture, ordinary construction situations and ornamentation. It educates while communicating ideals. The Bauakademie was the first major public building in Berlin where the brick construction was shown. Brick as a building material has a long tradition in northern Germany and it is readily available and cheap to produce. Remember what we talked about earlier that Prussia was basically broke? Summarizing the construction, we have a system that is prefabricated and relies on a skeletal construction. This might already give you a hint why the building is important. When we look at the impact the building had, the first thing that comes to mind is that it was a school for architecture, so its students had a direct impact. When we look at the alumni, we can find well-known architects such as August Friedrich Stühler, who designed the new museum, but we find also a large number of architects who made up what we now call the Berlin School or also Schinkel School. They created their own distinct style in architecture and influenced people like Hermann Muthesius or Peter Behrens, who were both part of the Werkbund, which worked closely with the Bauhaus. Another impact that was quite immediate is the replication of ideas of the Bau Academy in other buildings. One such example is the Red Town Hall in Berlin. When comparing the plan organization, the construction system, material and facade, we can find a lot of parallels. The architect who designed it was a student of the Bau Academy. Another current that we can see is prefabrication becoming more important in the construction industry. Before being able to use prefabrication to the extent that it is used today, a large enough industrial base was needed. The conceptual and construction logic of the grid floor plan with its main load bearing elements being columns was further developed and pointly summarized almost a hundred years later when Le Corbusier developed Dom Inno during the First World War. When looking at large-scale construction sites nowadays, we can see the omnipresence of the separation of the facade and load-bearing structure. To finish the video, I'd like to quote historian Jörg Templer. A strict functionality, the skeletal construction and the overcoming of the classical principles of bearing and supporting loads have become commonplace in modern architecture and the Bar Academy is considered its origin. That's it. Thank you for watching our video. Um, please like and subscribe if you want to discover more buildings with us, the environment that shaped them and the influences they had until this day. And until we see you again, have a good day.